So our last presenter, Ian Hinchcliffe, uh, is going to tell us about how the universe works and, more importantly, why we should care. Uh, but uh, because we've saved some time and because we have a little extra, we're going to give him a, a little addendum. We're going to go past the eight minutes. I don't think you'll mind. A couple of extra minutes on Ian's. I think you'll find it worth it. Well, please welcome Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Hinchliff, a senior physicist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and a collaborator on one of the two experiments that found the Higgs boson uh, a year ago. So I'm pleased to be in the Berkeley Rep giving this talk because I now have two things in common with one of these gentlemen, Patrick Stewart. He stood there, sat in a chair right there. Uh, and we were born in the same small town in England. So three weeks ago, you may have uh, noticed that the Higgs boson was given a, a, the Nobel Prize. Uh, it was given to Mr. Peter Higgs and Francoise Anglaire for work they did in 1964, almost 50 years ago. So it's a legitimate question to ask, you know, what took so long? Uh, they did this thing years ago. What, were they all asleep in Stockholm? No, they weren't all asleep. But of course, until last year, the summer of 2012, uh, it was just a theory. There was no evidence that, the, that their theory was right. And in the summer of, of 2012, the Higgs boson, which I'll describe a little in a moment, was discovered by two experiments at CERN, one of which, uh, one of which I'm a member of, uh, and there was this big fuss. People asked, why were we having it on the 4th of July, which is a holiday? It's not a holiday in Switzerland. <laughs> Right, so the point, what we're trying to ask, uh, what's the, what am I interested in, what's the Higgs boson got to do with everyday life and, and you? Um, I'm asking the question, what are we all made of and how do we all work at a very fundamental level? Well, we're all flesh and blood, I think. Um, and inside that, that means we're all atoms, molecules, and inside atoms there are protons and neutrons and uh, electrons. And inside that, the very fundamental objects are electrons and the things that build up nuclei, the quarks. And we think those are point-like objects. And that's what we sort of know now. There's a picture of, of a helium atom, to give you some idea of, of, of what I'm talking about. And if this nucleus were the size of this uh, room here, the atom would extend out somewhat beyond the Farallon Islands. So this is not to scale. Right, so the fundamental questions that I'm interested in and I'm trying to address are that we discovered lots of particles over the last 50 years. What do they have to do with each other? Why are some of them heavier than others? What, what does the mass come from? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, if I do astrophysics experiments of the type talked about by my the previous speaker, and I look and ask in the rest of the universe, what's it made of? It's not really made, mostly, of the same stuff that we're made of. So what's the rest of this stuff? The third question that I'd like to know the answer to is why are we here at all? In the sense that if I start with a very hot early universe, I would expect that all the particles and all the antiparticles have annihilated and there's nothing left. But we're still here. So those are the, the three questions. And after the Mr. Higgs and uh, the LHC experiments, we've answered the first of these uh, three questions. So now here's a blank slide. And the reason for a blank slide is I have to explain to you what a Higgs boson is. And I can do this in two ways. I can have 50 slides uh, full of equations, or I can try a speech and a blank slide. So I'm going to try the speech and the blank slide. Okay. So the Higgs mechanism, which is underlies this theory, is a mechanism which gives mass to all the particles. So you guys are the Higgs field. Everybody sitting here. And I'm a particle who's trying to get mass by interacting with you guys. So if I need to get to the back of the room, I have to climb over all the seats. It takes me a hell of a long time to get there because I've interacted with everybody. I'm slow, therefore I'm heavy. If I run up the aisle, there's less obstruction. I can get to the back faster, and therefore I'm a lighter particle. I have less interaction with you guys, I weigh less. That's how the Higgs mechanism works. It gives mass to all the particles by interacting with them. Now, Higgs, however, predicted a Higgs boson. What's that? I want to get a message to the guy sitting in the back row I can't see because these lights are too bright. Um, I could do it by speaking to you and asking you to tell the person behind you, and eventually a message would get back to the back of the room. It would take a while. Um, but I wouldn't have to go there myself. So the propagation of that message in the Higgs field is a Higgs boson, essentially. So it's a collective phenomenon of you guys. 
Right, so I now need to make a Higgs, but I've got to prove this is not just a theory. So in order to prove it's not just a theory, I have to make a Higgs boson and I have to detect it. So to make one, I need a particle accelerator. I take two protons, I bash them together, all this junk comes out. I look at the stuff and I try to infer that I actually produced a Higgs boson in this mess. So for that, I need a, a machine. And it's not very easy to produce a Higgs boson, as you can see from this number. Whoops, I knew I would do that. As you can see from this... Uh, number, which I can't pronounce at the bottom, uh, you have to do it many, many times before you actually find anything. So the machine is in Switzerland. It's just outside Geneva. It's buried underground. And this gives you some idea of the scale of the Large Hadron Collider. This is an airport you can just see up at the top there with the airport runway visible. So that gives you an idea of the scale. And there are four detectors which will look at the remnants from the collision that I just showed you and try to infer the existence of the... Higgs boson. I'm on one of those collaborations, which is a worldwide collaboration. This is our collaboration map with every country on which we have collaborators colored in. The detector sits underground quite close to the CERN main gate. Um, it's about half the size of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, there's a little person standing there, which gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, the thing in the very center, the very smallest thing, which you can't see in this, uh, this picture, is the thing that was built by the people here in Berkeley. It's the most precise part of the detector. So it may be the smallest, but it's also the most important because it has the most precision and it's closest to the point where the Higgs gets produced. So here's a video. So this is how it works. So uh, uh, hydrogen atoms are taken from a bottle. They're slowly accelerated by being passed through a sequence of magnets and uh, electric fields which slowly inject much more energy and then they're finally injected into the LHC tunnel which is shown there at the, and they're going to collide at some point. So now we go inside the tunnel. Uh, somebody's written some graffiti there on the wall which some of you might recognize. So there's a superconducting magnet. Inside the superconducting magnets we have a beam of protons. In a minute it'll go, there we are. So here's inside the proton which you can think of as being three quarks. These are circulating in opposite directions. They're about to collide in the atlas detector which is now coming into view. Uh, you see the two incoming things. They smash together. A whole bunch of junk comes out. There it goes. And out of this junk, there are four particular particles which are colored in, and those are the products of a Higgs decay. So this is a simulation except for the end, where a real physics event has been overlaid on top of it. Um, and now somebody's helped you by drawing in the lines of the four objects that the Higgs boson decayed into. So that's what I'm about. And now I'm going to answer the question as to uh, what use is it. Well, as you've probably noticed in this stream of talks, I'm the most obscure of all the speakers in the sense that I'm the one who's least connected to reality. I guess that's why they put me, <laughs> that's why they put me at the end. I don't know. So it's very difficult to explain why people do fundamental research. You do it because you're trying to learn things that are new. You're not doing it because I'm trying to build a meta mousetrap. If I wanted to build a meta mousetrap, I would build a mental mousetrap. So <laughs> apart from the last person in this chain, which I'm going to go through, they were all doing uh, fundamental research. The last person was not. So you take discoveries made by all these people, you put them together, and you get some common thing, which I will ask the audience to name when I finished making the speech. So the person up on the top left is Alessandro Volta, who was working in 1790 uh, with sheets of metal and um, cloths uh, soaked in sulfuric acid. And, at that, and he made the first battery, what we would now call the first battery. Totally useless, because he had nothing to connect it to. <laughs> the next person is Michael Faraday, who was doing research in the 1830s. And he was looking at the electrical properties of materials, having figured out that he could connect Volta's battery to that. Um, one of the things he discovered that well, there were some materials with rather strange properties, which we now call semiconductors. Remember, we're still in the steam age. Nobody knows anything about electricity. And at this point, you might want to ask yourself, if you were voting for somebody from Congress in these ancient years, would you have voted for somebody who would have voted to fund the research of these people or not? Because if your answer is, I would not have voted to fund the research, you're not allowed to have the object, which is under the question mark at the end. <laughs> the third person is Ada Lovelace, who is regarded as the first person to write a computer program. This is about 1840. 
totally useless because she had no computer on which to run it. <laughs> the person on the bottom left is Heinrich Hertz, uh, who in the 1880s decided to do an experiment to test one of the predictions of electromagnetic theory, which had been developed in the 19th century. And one of these predictions was the existence of what we now call radio. So Hertz built a small experimental apparatus in his laboratory, produced a radio signal, and then detected it. The next person is, of course, Einstein. Everybody recognizes Einstein. And uh, in 1916, Einstein came up with the theory of general relativity, which everybody says has absolutely nothing to do with everyday life. Certainly, Einstein thought that. But I'm afraid these days you couldn't be more wrong, because whenever you drive anywhere, you all use GPS in order not to get lost. And if you don't know, if the person who well, programmed the GPS doesn't know about general relativity, the GPS system would have a lifetime of about three minutes. It would become totally useless after about three minutes. So the last person on this list is somebody who was trying to design something that was of immediate use. That's Tim Berners-Lee, who was working at CERN, where the Higgs was discovered, in about 1989. And he was trying to devise a system which enabled scientists distributed all over the world to communicate in a more efficient manner, both technical information. Uh, so he's, in some sense, the origin of the World Wide Web. So you have battery, semiconductor, computer program, wireless, GPS, and World Wide Web. And the answer is? Thank you.